In this video, we're going to look at a Python function that has no arguments, i.e. no input parameters, but it does return a value. The previous video in this playlist looked at the general types of functions that we can have within Python, and any programming language for that matter, and they're shown here. And we've already looked at one that takes an input argument and doesn't return anything, and we've also looked at this one in a previous video to the last one. If we, however, consider this particular video, what we're going to be doing is looking at this, where you call a function and something is returned. Let's consider the following. We're going to have a call to a function called getTime, and the code inside the getTime, i.e. the mechanics of the getTime, the algorithm, if you like, is actually going to get the current time in hours, minutes, and seconds. And it's going to return that. Now, the first thing we can see about this, it only has a return value. There are no parameters going in. So let's have a look at a suitable module specification for this. And we can see it here. And we have the usual things with a module specification. We have a function name, input parameters, local variables, the mechanics, and the return value. Let's start off with the function name. We can see that, in fact, it's called get time. If we look at the input parameters, there are none. Hence, I've got the word none here. For local variables, well, I'm going to let the programmer decide whether there's need for local variables when they're going through implementing these mechanics here. Now, if we have a look at the mechanics, we can see that it says calculate the seconds based on the epoch. Now, we'll talk about the epoch in a moment. Then it says calculate the minutes since based on the epoch. Then calculate the hours since based on the epoch and then form a string holding time in hours, minutes and seconds. And the return value is going to be time now. So time now is going to be the string that holds the hours, the minutes and the seconds, which is going to be returned to whatever module calls the get time. Let's turn our attention to the epoch. Now, if we consider time, what we have, we have a timeline that carries on forever. And at some point on this timeline, we mark it off with something referred to as the epoch. Now, this is actually the time at midnight on the 1st of January, 1970. And we can measure time from this particular point. And if I want to find the current time, what I'm able to do is to find the number of seconds elapsed between the epoch and the current time and this is the time which we can describe as the elapsed time in seconds now if we now consider well how do i get the current time well there's something in python which you can use dot notation for and it's shown here it's time full stop time and you can see the two brackets now essentially what this will do it'll get hold of the time in seconds and so many milliseconds so there'll be a fraction to this particular elapsed time in seconds so if i was now to say right let's use this to find out the elapsed time in seconds and what i'm going to do is you can see it here and it's going to be assigned to a variable called epoch time and i therefore have decided as the programmer i do need a variable and i need this variable here and what this is going to return, for example, it depends when you run it, because obviously as you run it at different times, you're going to get a different value returned. This is typically something like this. So after this statement is executed, the epoch time could typically be bound to this number here. And you can see there's the whole part of the number, which are the number of seconds, and this is the number of fractions of a second here. Now, of course, we're not really interested in these fractional bits here. So what we can do, we can have another program statement shown here where I've got the variable total seconds, and that is going to be assigned the epoch time after I've passed it through the integer function. And, of course, what this is going to do, it's going to return this. So after this statement, total seconds would be bound to this value. And if you look at that value, you can see it's this bit of the epoch time that was calculated with this program statement here. Let's consider this snippet of code here. And we can see we've got three program statements, and these two we've just discussed. 
So let's turn our attention to this particular line. And in particular, let's look at this bit. And we can see that the total seconds, and we have this operator, and then we have 60. Now we should remember that what this operator will do, it finds the remainder when a division has taken place. So here, total seconds divided by 60, this operator effectively does that, but it doesn't give you how many times 60 goes into the total seconds. It tells you what the remainder is. So let's imagine we've gone back in time now, and we're 67 seconds past the epoch. So total seconds is 67. If I then use this operator, and then I have 60 here, 60 into 67 goes once, that's the division bit, but that is thrown away here, we have a remainder of 7. So what will happen when this is 67 and we use this operator and then 60, we get 7. It tells you the remainder is 7 seconds. Consequently, the current second is 7. 7 seconds past the minute after the epoch. That's what this is really telling us. Let's use the trace table to describe the execution of this particular snippet of code. Here we can see an appropriate trace table, and you can see I've got the three program statements in this column, and here you can see the column headings are the variable names that are used in the actual program. If we have a look at the first line here, what we will know when this executes is that the epoch time is going to get this. So I'm using the example we've already seen. Now the total seconds and the current seconds, well clearly they're not used by the program yet. They will be in a moment. So I would usually type in here, I would write in here, do not care, which I often abbreviate to DNC. Let's now move on to the next program statement here. And of course, when this executes, things are going to happen to the, the variables. And if we have a look at the epoch time, well, what we can say about that, that simply we copy it down because it's not going to be altered. We're using it in the program statement, but it doesn't get altered. If we consider the current second column for a moment, of course, this isn't altered by the program statement we're considering. So we mark that as a do not care. Now, if we have a close look at this particular program statement, what we can see is we're taking the int of the epoch time. So what's going to happen is this bit of the epoch time is going to be put into total seconds, as we can see here. Let's now consider this program statement here, and we can ask a question about how it affects the variables. And of course, with respect to the epoch time, it doesn't have any effect on it. Copy that down. It also has no effect on total seconds. It uses total seconds in the program statement, but it doesn't alter it in any way. So copy that down. This operator will give the remainder when the total seconds is divided by 60. And the result in this particular case will be 30 seconds. So the number of seconds passed, whatever the current minute will be, is 30 seconds. Of course, a moment ago, we did it for 67 seconds, and we knew the remainder was 7. But here, the remainder when you divide the total seconds by 60 is 30. Now consider the following snippet of code here. And we've just looked at the first three, and now you can see we have these two program statements. If we consider the first program statements, you can see here that we have a division taking place, where the total seconds are going to be divided by 60. And that's going to give us the total minutes. Because if you know how many seconds you've got, and you divide by 60, then clearly you're going to get the number of minutes. But note that the operator used here is an operator that's going to give us an integer result. And of course, once we've got the total minutes, we can take the total minutes, and we can use this operator to find out what the remainder will be when divided by 60. And that'll be the current minute. This will be the minute past the current hour because of course we're finding the remainder using this operator when it's 60 and of course there's 60 minutes in an hour so let's further our description of the code so far using a trace table and here's the trace table and you can see that i've added two more columns where these columns tell us about the total minutes and the current minute and you can see here that i've 
got this from the previous trace table we were looking at a moment ago. So when we come on to this program statement here, what we need to ask first of all is what's happened to the variables that are not going to be affected by this particular program statement. And I'm showing that appearing now. What we are interested in is this column here, what the total minutes are going to be. And of course, that's going to be the total seconds divided by 60. Now here's the total seconds, and when we divide that by 60, the result we're going to get is this result here. And you can see it's an integer, there's no fractional bits, because we've chosen the operator appropriately. Let's now consider this program statement here. And first off, let's consider what happens to the variables that are not affected by what's in this particular program statement. And we can clearly see that they are the values I've copied down. Now the one we are interested in is this column here, the current minute. Because we can see that the current minute is assigned this. Where this is the total minutes, and this operator will find the remainder when the total minutes are divided by 60. Now this is the value of the total minutes and the remainder we will get when we divide by 60 using the operator I've just described in fact will be this value here it'll be 13. So we are 13 minutes past the current hour whatever the current hour may be. So so far what we can say is that we are 13 minutes 30 seconds as the current time of course, now we need to work out, well, what's the current hour? Let's consider this snippet of code, which is what we've looked at already with the addition of these two lines. If we have a look at this line, it's very similar to what we've seen before, but here we're taking the total minutes and we're dividing that by 60. And we're choosing the appropriate operator to do the division so we don't get any fractional bits. And of course, this is assigned to total hours. Because, obviously, if you take the total minutes and you divide it by 60, you're going to get the total hours. Now, this line then takes the total hours and it uses this operator, which will find the remainder when you divide by 24. Because there are 24 hours in a day. Consequently, the current hour will be equal to the number of hours past midnight. Here you can see a computer program. And if you have a look at these statements here, they are identical to these. And here you can see I've got three print statements. And what they're simply going to do, they're going to output user-friendly strings together with the current hour, the current minute, and the current second. One of the things I would like to point out here, you see this line, use this, time dot time, and then those two brackets. Now this is dot notation. And in fact, what time is, it? it's a method that will go and get the current time in seconds and fractions of seconds. Now, in order to be able to use this, what we have to do with Python, we have to import time. In other words, this is going to be a module, and this module contains the code to allow us to do this. So if you want to actually use this, you have to have this at the top of your program. Now, when the program actually executes, what you're going to get out is this here. The hours are going to be 9, the minutes are going to be 13, and the seconds are going to be 30. So it's 9, 13, 30. 9 hours, 13 minutes, 30 seconds. Of course, we've just looked at some code that will actually find the time for us, but the idea now is we want this code to be the mechanics of a function, because that's what really what this video is about, a function that returns a value. It doesn't take any input parameters in, but it returns a value. So to achieve this, we're going to have a testing program, and we're going to have this testing program call a function called getTime, and we're going to have returned to the testing program the time now. Now, of course, the testing program must have a variable in it that's capable of receiving what's returned from the function getTime, and I'm going to call that the current time. So the testing program is going to be as shown here. We're going to have current time is assigned get time. So this line is the call to the function. And then of course what the function will do is return to the current time what the current time is and then we're going to print the current time on the screen to see if the function is behaved in the way in which we expect it to behave. Let's now consider this particular computer program here. 
and here you can see we've got the test program that I was just describing and here we have the function now if you have a close look at the function you can see the header and it starts off with the DEF it ends with the colon and in the middle you can see we've got the name get time as the name of the function now this lot is indented now this is the body of the actual function this is the mechanics as it appears in the module specification and this here is the return value if we look at this block this is the block of code that we've already discussed in the video today to show how this actually functions but this line here what this is going to do it's going to convert the current hour to a string the current minute the current second and you can see with these plus signs we're concatenating these strings together with these two literal strings here now when the string is formed it is assigned to time now and when we go to this line we can see that we are then returning time now so we return the string so we can see that this function has a return value and this function does not have any input parameters because these brackets here are empty so the execution of this particular program is as followed this is the first line to be executed and of course this line is a call to this function so the next thing to now be executed is this function here and of course all of this code here is executed and then we come to the return value and the return value will return the time now and that is effectively returned to this position where it is then assigned to current time and consequently on the next line we print out what was returned to current time and what we will see is this here we will see 9 hours 13 minutes 30 seconds of course when considering this program we have to remember that we have to do this import here if we want this to be able to be executed something else I would like to point out this line here we can see as current time is assigned get time well it's actually possible to put the get time inside these brackets here replacing the current time and removing this line completely as you can see by the next program here you see here I've simply got print get time and this get time is a call to this function and then it will execute in the same way check out the supporting website for these videos and also consider subscribing to the YouTube channel also consider subscribing to the Google Plus circle that relates to these videos in addition why not consider follow me on Twitter where I issue a tweet every time I complete and upload a new video to the YouTube channel and supporting websites